Six weeks later, pardon me, six weeks later, Chickadee Valley, February 18th, same year, and this is the feature that ran. You can see it's much, much larger. Same crest, October 25th, uh, rain crest. You can see all the rocks poking out there. So really, really close to the ground. It's a much larger avalanche. So it was a size 3.5, it's two meters deep, 300 meters wide across there. Uh, 1,000 meter horizontal run distance, so if you just measured from uh, one end to the other and brought it up so it was horizontal, it'd be a kilometer across. And uh, the vertical run distance, you took an elevation at the top here, and then it the debris and uh, subtracted the difference, it'd be 500 meters that way, so substantially large avalanche. <clears throat> so this photo here illustrates a couple of points. Uh, the first is the magnitude, once again, like the helicopter here is sort of level with the uh, fracture line. And the other point is, if you look at these trees around here, that's an indication of the historical runout of this avalanche path. So say if the trees were 75 years old, uh, you, you could say that an avalanche significantly didn't surpass that in 75 to 100 years. Now, if you look at the debris, let's see if I can hold my hand steady enough, you can see it almost filled the whole thing. Okay, so probably on this year, that was as big as that avalanche path ran. Okay, so keep that in mind for the bulletin that's coming up here in a second. So uh, this was the burial location right there. You can just see the uptrack, and they were probably right around here when the slide occurred. Now, an interesting point here is, from that point to the other side of the slide path was 300 meters. From that point to here was two meters. Okay, they were just on the edge of it, and uh, no avalanche debris here. And that sort of leads into the next slide. This is the rescue team on scene. And uh, more to the point, if you look at that line there, it's pretty shallow, hey? It's not steep at all. It's, it's a little bit of an oblique angle, but it's probably no more than 20 degrees. So what were the, uh, the optimal angles for, for an avalanche again? Yeah, so where they were, you probably couldn't have triggered an avalanche, right? The other point is, the terrain choice, they were right along the side here, you know? So I'm just kind of thinking of the mindset. They weren't risk takers. It was actually two young ladies. And uh, as they were making their way up here, you know, they were kind of aware of, you know, maybe I don't want to be out in the middle. I want to be close to the side. They just might have misjudged the, the capacity for a large avalanche that day, okay? They weren't skiing steep slopes. So uh, this is the recovery. Very similar to St. Perrin, it was a 70 centimeter burial here at the burial time, two plus hours. Now, very, very unfortunately in this event, the, uh, the partner that wasn't buried was incapacitated. She was injured on her right side and she couldn't search. So that's when uh, we came into play after that. So same sort of thing, we're back to the avalanche bulletin the day before here. I'll just highlight the red. You feel free to read the whole thing, though. So there was a rapid uh, warming spike. So this rapid warming will result in natural avalanche activity on solar aspects. Okay? Avalanches to size 3, as observed in the last couple of days, will likely result. Expect this aspect to enter a high danger rating as daytime warming reaches its maximum. Okay, so. We, we realized on the weather models that it was going to get hot the next day, so we're screaming at people, you know, it's going to get hot, solar aspects are going to be avalanching, and that's exactly what happened that day, to a T that was said right in this bulletin. So that brings me to limitations of the avalanche bulletin. So the forecast region is just shy of 10,000 square kilometers, and uh, we have one avalanche forecaster per day and they can only observe so much terrain. So it's really hard for us to predict what's happening in the far northwest corner of Banff National Park, specifically on slope. You know, we might never get there you know, in a career of avalanche forecasting. So what we try to do is try to you know, incorporate the big picture. You know, any specific slope, we're not going to be able to tell you if that's going to avalanche or not, but we give you the general trend of what's happening out there and give you uh, very generic sort of travel advisories. Okay? Now what helps us out there um, Rocket here working at Lake Louise and then Rowan working at Sunshine Village. They're both professional avalanche forecasters. So that sort of adds to our uh, pool of knowledge and 
many days at 4.30 in the afternoon, we're calling those guys up looking for, for more information. So that helps us out. But even with all those professionals working together, we can never predict the anomalies. Right? There's always that 1% out there that you just, you know, that, that weird thing that happens and everything's pointing towards, you know, good stability, uh, low avalanche hazard, and then you get an avalanche anyway. So it, we can't predict those. So what can you do? You can learn how to interpret the avalanche bulletin. So a, way, a good way of doing that is actually reading it. And um, you know those little colorful blocks up on the top of the screen there, well, it does give you an indication of what's happening. But read the text in detail, the whole thing. And if you read that over the whole winter, it just becomes like a storybook, one chapter after the next. And uh, you know, if you don't know anything about avalanches, I bet you if you read the avalanche bulletin every day, you would have a pretty good idea of what was happening out there if you knew nothing about avalanches. Make sure you have the necessary experience level. So if you've done three ski tours in your life, and then you think you want to go and ski Mount Columbia in a day at the end of your season, you might want to go, well, that that's going to be something for next year. So just don't bite off more than you can chew. And uh, ensure you have the capability for companion rescue with your beacon, probe, and shovel. Get information online, take an avalanche course, all sorts of stuff like that. So um, I'll just talk lightly about this. If you need one of these guys to come and get you, you want to make this with your hands. And if you don't need anybody to come and get you, you want to make one of those. And you probably want me to elaborate a little bit. Um, quite often, as rescuers, it's kind of hard to determine what people need if there's no verbal communication. If we get a third or a fourth or a fifth hand report that somebody needs help out there, you know, sometimes we will think it's prudent to go and have a look, investigate, and we'll fly up. And then uh, maybe we find some people. And if it's not totally obvious that they're you know, laying there bleeding or anything, they're standing up, but it's kind of unclear whether they need help or not, it can be very, very difficult to you know, determine whether to take further action or to go away. A number of incidents this summer sort of led us to, uh, to come up with this idea. So you'll be seeing a lot of posters around Banff, Alpine Club huts, um, articles and things like that. We want to get this message across that if you can't communicate with a rescue helicopter and you need help, make that symbol right there. You don't want to wave. You just want to stand there like this. Okay. Stand there for a few seconds to make it really obvious. And if you don't need help, just do this. Same thing. Don't wave and stay there. And we'll get the message. We're, we're gone. Are there, are there any questions about this? It's pretty straightforward. But most of all, guys, Safely enjoy the mountains of Banff Co <laughs> Yoho Kuni National Parks this winter. So thanks and have a great day. Keeper needs to find somebody to give a backpack to. Keeper!